Dr. Ken Landa, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Amavig, a drug also known as Arinumab. This is for the prevention of, not for the treatment, but for the prevention of migraine headaches. It was approved in May of 2018 as the first drug in its class. It's a monthly injection. You give yourself at home. You inject it pretty much like insulin, just underneath the surface of the skin. It's manufactured by two of the giants in the industry, Amgen and Novartis. And it seems to block the ability of a chemical known as calcitonin gene-related peptide to bind to the cells in the nervous system doesn't react against the calcitonin gene-related peptide at all. It relates to preventing that chemical from docking on the nerve cells that seem to lead to the migraine headaches. Now, migraine headaches are extraordinarily common. They occur in about 10% of the population, women three times more often than men. The headaches seem to be extreme, and they're pulsating, and they're throbbing, and they're localized to one area of the head, about a third of the people can predict the onset of a headache because they have an aura, a temporary sensory or visual disturbance. Maybe they see some zigzag lines or flashing lights, or maybe they have a short-lived loss of vision that then progresses to nausea, and then they have some sensitivity to light or to sound. That can last for a short period of time, and then all of a sudden the headache appears, and the headache lasts for hours to days, oftentimes debilitating, leads to anxiety and depression in some people. Headaches can be divided, these migraines, into episodic migraines or chronic migraines. With episodic migraines, the person is affected on 4 to 14 days a month. With chronic migraine, they're affected for at least 15 days a month. Fortunately, the episodic is more common than the chronic. Episodic migraine is about 90% of all migraine headaches. Now, for prevention of headache, we have a variety of medicines, but most have not specifically been approved for preventing migraine headaches. They were approved for other purposes. So topramate and propranolol and toprolol and amitriptyline, those have long been on the market, and it was found that they might have something to do with perhaps preventing migraine in some people. Then they did some studies and showed that actually Botox, the injection of Botox, when given in special areas, might be able to prevent the migraine headaches. That was specifically approved for the purpose. But we don't have any really completely effective therapy, at least at the present time. So way back in the 1980s, doctors were performing experiments with this calcitonin gene-related peptide. And what they did was they looked at people who had a history of migraine headaches. They didn't have migraine at the time, but they had a history of the migraine headaches, and they injected them with the chemical, and they developed migraines. People who didn't have a history of migraines, they didn't develop any migraine when they got the shot. Well, it seems that this CGRP, the chemical, acts like a neurotransmitter. It seems to modulate pain and vasodilation, and it seems to be pretty much localized to the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, and specifically to the trigeminal root ganglia, where it seems that the reactions that lead to migraine tend to occur. Well, the drug, Amavig, can be used for people who have either episodic or chronic migraine headache at least four migraine days a month, it's a human monoclonal antibody directed against the receptor where the CGRP would dock on the cells. It doesn't have anything to do with the CGRP itself. It just blocks its ability to get to that trigeminal root ganglia cell or wherever else it's going to work. It's made by recombinant technology. It's grown in Chinese hamster ovarian cells. It's a type of gamma globulin. The first study that was performed that made it to the general medical press was printed not too long ago, just in November of 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine. They evaluated people who on average were about age 41, and these people had between eight and eight and a half migraine days a month. Well, the company funded a big study so, number one, they funded the study. And some of the authors were affiliated with the company, point two. And they needed or wanted 955 patients in this study. 
And to get 955 patients, remember about 10% of the population with migraine headaches, go to New York City, go to Chicago, go to Los Angeles. You got the patients. But what the company did was they went to 121 different sites in the United States and in Canada and Austria and Belgium and Czech Republic and Poland and Slovakia and Sweden and Turkey and in the United Kingdom. All of those different places, which means that they really lost some control over some of the patients, you would think, because they don't have the centralized ability to evaluate. Well, these people, anyway, had migraine headache, and they had qualified migraine headaches. They had the typical features, the unilateral pain, the throbbing, the moderate to severe discomfort, the pain that got worse with activity or with movement or exercise, and they also had at least one non-pain feature, nausea, vomiting, the sensitivity to light or to sound, or they were taking medicine for their acute headache. And what the patients did is they kept a little electronic diary. So any day that they experienced either the onset or the continuation or the recurrence of pain, they would put a little tick in the diary. And these patients were further selected because if they didn't respond to at least to more than two of the preventive therapies, well, they were excluded from the study because they were thought to be non-responders to begin with. So here we have a group that seems like relatively typical patients, and they divided them. 300 about got 70 milligrams once a month, 300 got 140 milligrams once a month, and 300 got placebo. And if they happened to have an acute headache during the month, they could take the standard medicine. So did they need less standard medicine? if they were taking the Amavig, well, they would take the standard medicine for one fewer day a month if they received the Amavig, and they basically didn't have any decrease in the use of the acute medicine if they were given the placebo. If we look at the total number of days of migraine headache, remember we're starting off with 8.3 about days a month, it was reduced if you were given the Amovig by somewhere around three and a half days versus about two days fewer migraine headache days if they were given the placebo. So it seems like there's some benefit, but it sure isn't a whopping benefit. Then they did another study, and this time they looked at about 600 patients, again about standard age of 40, and most of the patients who were involved in any of these studies are women, and most of them are Caucasians, and again, they have about eight migraine days a month, but they only gave them either the 70 milligram or the placebo, and the people receiving the 70 milligram, remember, they're starting off with about eight migraine days a month. They reduced it by three days a month. The placebo group reduced it by about two days a month, and if we look at the reduction of the number of days that you would have to take the supplemental medicines for the acute treatment was reduced by about a day in the people who were given the therapy, and it was reduced by about half a day overall in the people who were given the placebo. Well, the company came up in 2016 with a rating scale for everyday activities and for physical impairment associated with migraine headaches. They called it the Migraine Physical Functioning Impact Diary. And they assessed the patients and they had a scale of 0 to 100. You had to have at least a five-point difference to show any significance. And in study number two, there was no statistical difference, at least as far as the patients were concerned, I mean the physical functioning or the impact between the drug and the placebo. On the first study, the STRIVE study, the company said there was a statistically significant difference, and the difference was about two points, two and a half points. But the company said you had to have five points to make a statistically significant difference. Well, so the medicine seems to work, but it doesn't seem to work in many patients all that well. It seems that if it's going to work, it's going to work within the first month or the first two months, so that by three months you can determine pretty much whether you're going to be a responder or not. And if you're not responding to the medicine, then you might as well stop it. Well, they did a study on chronic migraine. And the chronic migraine, that study was published in 
the Lancet Neurology in June of 2017, and again, the same sort of story where it was done in the United States and Canada and Czechoslovakia and Poland and the United Kingdom and Sweden and Norway and in Germany. And it looked at people who had at least 15 headache days a month, including at least eight migraine days a month. And again, it excluded people if they hadn't responded to several preventive therapies previously, like the beta blocker, the topramate, or the Botox, or the amitriptyline. So again, we're selecting, we're getting the best treatment, best patients available for the treatment. And again, the patients were on average age 40 or thereabout, most of them were women, most of them were white, and this time they had about 18 migraine days a month. 18 of these days in a month with migraine. What was the benefit of the treatment? The treatment was given 70 milligram, 140 milligrams, and basically it reduced the number of migraine days in the people who received the active treatment between six and a half and seven days six and a half to seven days fewer versus four days fewer with placebo. Were they able to reduce the number of days that they needed to take other medicine for the acute migraine headaches? Yeah, by about three and a half or four days versus about two days with the placebo. Interestingly, about 15 to 20 percent of the patients didn't respond at all to therapy or actually got worse during therapy, and during therapy they still had on the medicine 11 to 12 headache days a month compared to 14 headache days when they were given a placebo. And if we go and add up all of the hours in the month and look to see if the therapy reduced the number of hours that the patients had the headaches, there really wasn't any difference between the drug and the placebo. Well, the good news is that the drugs not associated with significant number of side effects might have little injection site reactions and pains and redness. Some people complain of constipation or cramps or muscle spasms and some people develop antibodies to the drug but we don't think that that really means anything. Hasn't been tested in pregnant women, women who are breastfeeding or in children. Hasn't really even been studied for carcinogenicity whether it causes cancer or tumors or not. It seems that the drug doesn't interfere with activity of other drugs, doesn't interfere even with the activity of drugs used to treat migraine headaches. Standard kind of chemistry involved in the medicine. It seems to bind to receptors. It's broken down the same way that the body would break down its own gamma globulin, which means that it's not dependent on kidney function or liver function. So if you have something wrong with your liver, something wrong with your kidney, you can still take the medicine comes as premixed syringes. Most people just need 70 milligrams. Some people need 140 milligrams. If you need the 140 milligrams, you take two shots of the 70 at different sites, but at the same time. Now, importantly, there is some natural rubber in the needle shield, so if you have an allergy to latex, you've got to stay away from this medicine. got to stay away from the drug. The drug, when it's given, when it's injected, it's either in the upper thigh, the upper arm, or around the belly. Obviously, if there's some redness or bruising or tenderness in the area, you don't pick that spot. Keep the medicine most of the time in the refrigerator, but if you're going on a vacation, you can take it out of the refrigerator for up to seven days. Shouldn't freeze it, shouldn't shake it. And it would appear that from our studies, from the studies I just mentioned, that this is not the answer to migraine headache prevention. It seems to have something to do with it, but we know that migraine headaches are a lot more complicated than calcitonin gene-related peptide. Now, this happens to be an area of intense interest. So Teva Pharmaceuticals and Lilly and Alder Pharmaceuticals in 2018, probably all of them will have drugs, but those drugs are going to be re going to react against the CGRP itself not against the receptor. So for whatever it's worth, the Amovig is going to be unique in that regard. Then Allergan next year is going to come out with uh, medication. How much does the drug cost? A lot. If you want to plunk down cash, it's going to cost you about $690 for just 70 milligrams of the drug. Interestingly, on good RX, 
they said that on July 4, 2018, the drug cost $307, and two weeks later, on July 18th of 2018, that price had gone from $307 all the way to $595, or about $19 a day. So it's going to cost you somewhere between $7,000 and $8,000 for a year's worth of therapy, but you could get a copay coupon so it doesn't require cash out of your pocket as long as you're not a Medicare recipient or TRICARE or Medicaid. According to the company, that price reflects the value that the drug brings to patients and to society. Huh. Really? Well, when the drug was originally going to come out, the company had planned to charge, it was estimated, about $10,000, but Express Scripts, one of those pharmacy benefit managers, they said, hey guys, uh, you better reconsider, because that's too high a price. And even though you give us rebates, for the consumer, the consumer has to come up with out-of-pocket cash based on the list price, not the price that we, the big companies, have to pay for the drug. And around that time, the company, the Express Scripts, told the company that you better remember the story that occurred when you guys brought out, or Amgen brought out, a cholesterol injection, an injection that would reduce your cholesterol dramatically reduce your cholesterol, but they charged $14,000. That was the list price of the medicine. And then, in response, the companies put up pre-authorization roadblocks and paperwork roadblocks. And then another company that was making the medicine, a similar medicine, they said, hey, we're going to reduce our price. We'll reduce our price from $14,000 to between $4,500 and $8,000, and express scripts said, okay, Imogen, your drug is off of the formulary. We're not going to accept your drug. We're going to accept this drug that does the same thing, but does it for a cheaper price. And Express Scripts told the combination of Amgen and Novartis, better think about that when you price the drug. So at least it was priced somewhat lower than it was originally anticipated to be, but the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, which is a watchdog for prices, said, oh my goodness, that the price you guys are charging, relatively few people who are potential candidates can receive the drug. Otherwise, the whole healthcare system is going to be overburdened with costs. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that it's a highly trumpeted drug, but it's only a small step forward. There's a lot more to migraine than CGRP. Now, some people who receive the drug are going to be phenomenally improved. Some people are not going to be improved at all. And most people are going to get a couple extra migraine-free days per month, but at a significant cost. Reminds me of what my father used to say. It's not the be-all and end-all. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.